Mr. President, uh, fellow uh, co-attendees, uh, honorable parliamentarians, my name is Verna Ayukekba, and I'm a senior vice president with the African Energy Chamber. I'm here today to speak on access to reliable and affordable and sustainable energy in Africa and how that can be driven by people-led partnership, by people-led partnership, which is what I believe this particular session is about with respect to taking into consideration uh, the needs and the requirements of people both in Europe and in Africa as well. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers for having me here to represent the African Energy Chamber. Uh, I want to thank as well the government of Angola for hosting us. And uh, very simple to myself, I am Cameroonian and uh, I work with the African Energy Chamber, which is an organization that seeks to attract and invest, attract investment into the oil and gas and energy space across Africa. So the question of energy transition, the question of access to reliable and affordable energy is something which is central and which is key to what it is that the chamber does. We advocate on a daily basis to be able to see that we can attract investment into the energy space. And the reason we focus on the energy space is very simple, uh, honorable members. That is because affordable and reliable energy is at the core of development. There is no way you can talk about access to education, access to health care, without really addressing affordable and reliable energy access. If at all you look at Europe, which is here represented, Europe was able to take out more than half of their population in a very short space of time due to the development of coal as a fuel, which led to the Industrial Revolution and was able to ultimately, in a people-centric manner, lead to people being taken out of poverty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Africa wants the same. All Africa is looking for is to ensure that it can take significant amounts of its populations out of poverty. And if you're looking and we constantly talk about education, we constantly talk about health care, affordable health care infrastructure, for all of that to happen in a realistic manner to touch most people, we need to be able to ensure that we can get access to reliable and affordable energy. And I'm so happy I'm speaking to representatives and parliamentarians because it is your job, ladies and gentlemen, to represent us and to be able to demand this from those who are in charge and those who are in power. When I look and listen to a people-led partnership, what I expect is to be able to say the people around Africa, I'm talking about those in Lagos, I'm talking about those in South Africa who are dealing with load shedding, I'm talking about those in Cameroon, I'm talking about those in Kidal, in Mali. Everybody wants the same thing. They want access to reliable and affordable power. I'm talking about those in Rwanda, I'm talking about those in the outskirts of that. The key figure if you had to retain one thing, is that we have more than six, over 600 million Africans who have no access to reliable or affordable energy, to none of that, more than six, that is about half of the population. And we have about 900 million Africans who have zero access to clean cooking fuels, most of them women and children. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our constituency. We need to be able to say the truths that is going to represent what these people are looking for and what they want is power. I'm going to be honest to say, in many cases, they really don't care where the molecules that create the power come from. They don't care whether it is coming from gas, 
or whether it's coming from solar or whether it's coming from hydro. What they care is reliable and affordable energy. And if at all we can't provide that for them, then I think we are in trouble. We also do need to recognize that you will not be able to develop agriculture, to develop industry, to be able to ensure that we can have jobs if at all we cannot push reliable and affordable energy. And that is why the chamber continues to say, for Africa, we need to first ensure access to power. Yes, we do believe transition is important. We do believe that energy transition is necessary. But Africa needs to industrialize. We need jobs. And so if that means that we need to use gas resources, ladies and gentlemen, we do need to hurry up and use those gas resources. We cannot transition in Luanda the same way we transition in New York. We can't transition in Lagos, in Kidal, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, the same way you transition in London or in Sweden or in Switzerland. And the simple reason is we need to look at our own realities here in Africa. That is what the chamber is saying. And look at the resources that we have on the continent. Yes, everybody wants to transition out of coal. I do too. But South Africa, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest economy on the continent is significantly dependent on coal more than 80 percent of south african power and so when you sit with your colleagues who are coming from the european union you need to tell them that in as much as they pass laws in europe that make it difficult to finance coal in europe they do need to look and say look we do need to cut some slack for african countries we do need to cut some slack for south africa because there is no amount of solar overnight that is going to ensure and guarantee that south africa can continue to produce the power that it needs and ladies and gentlemen south africa does export power to neighboring countries to namibia to 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 zimbabwe uh, so what that means ultimately is that you have a significant amount of population that is dependent on coal steel I do want to transition as well, but what I am saying is that we need a transition that is fair, that is realistic. And if at all you are going to have countries or people who emit to pay for emissions, I would sign up. But what I would say is that since we are in a situation where historical emissions also have contributed to where we are, it only makes sense for you to also target those who have been emitting historically. Now, this is not something where we need to be antagonistic towards each other. What we are saying at the chamber is that you really need to consider the reality in which African countries find themselves. We have 3% emissions in the world. Now, one needs to take that into consideration and to say the single fridge of somebody in California does take more power than whole villages and cities in Africa. It's important for us to be able to take that into consideration and say, Africa needs to industrialize, Europe needs to decarbonize. That is the way we see it. And yes, we're going to join in those efforts, but at our own pace in that sense. If you come here, we need solar. We need you know, gas to be able to represent clean coal. In many quarters, if you go, they will tell you they can't finance gas. But you need gas to be able to reduce emissions if at all you are going to take coal off. By the way, a lot of very, very, I would say, uh, big European economies are now, and I don't blame them for it, they are importing coal out of South Africa, the same coal they said they didn't want. Now, the reason for that is energy security. I don't blame them for that. But then, ladies and gentlemen, we need to look then at increasing energy security in Africa as well. And if that means investing in gas 
we hell have to invest and double down our efforts to invest in gas. We need to look at hydro. Uh, Angola has been doing a significantly good job with respect to hydro. We saw some of that here. Uh, if you look at Lauka, for example, 2.1 gigabytes, and we've seen Angola say, in terms of generation, they are likely to go from 6.3 to over 8 gigawatts uh, in 2027. Now, what that means is that Angola is producing more power than they actually need as a country. This is where we need to encourage countries to work together. DRC, which is just above Zambia, they all need power, which Angola is producing in abundance. So we need to look at those infrastructure projects that are cross-national, that can actually ensure that you have power produced in one place, but is also used in another place. Not everybody must have a dam, not everybody must have a power station, but if you have transmission lines in which you invest this, and this is where I invite our European friends to ensure that investment which is going into some of these transnational projects is not sanctioned or is not allowed because it's power coming from a gas plant. We need to be able to use the resources that we have on the ground. I'm going to end, ladies and gentlemen, by saying this. We have to prioritize people. It is about people. And if at all solar does not give us base load, then solar should be seen as complementary. And we should not be looking at sanctioning order. We can't sanction Chad, for example, because they're trying to use gas out of the gas resources that they have. The amount of base load that solar is producing, if it's not able to provide a basis for industrialization, for you to be able to drive transition of agricultural products, then ladies and gentlemen, we need to look at ensuring that Africa can transition at its own pace. I heard the gentleman from Mauritius talking about Mauritius being exposed to changes, climate change. So I agree, solar is important. I agree, other sources are important. And hence, we need to look at ensuring that we continue to promote that as well. But all I am saying is there should not be anything taken off the table when it comes to energy security, because our children are also on Facebook. Our children also have mobile phones. All of that needs power. And African children deserve to have access to whatever it is other kids have everywhere. Mm -hmm.